I'm, uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me here. And uh, it's my great honor and pleasure because uh, today uh, is a special day for me. I represent here ICROM, which is the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. And it is based in Rome. And one of our, you know, very, um, like one of the founding directors, the Director General of ICROM, Mr. Elder, is here in the audience. So I'm very grateful for that. And I'm honored that you are here, sir. Uh, I would like to begin with this image of Madonna. Uh, she's, uh, it's, it's, she's called Madonna the Adonorata, a grieving Madonna, a grief stricken Madonna. And she's very special for the people of Central Italy who suffered through devastating earthquakes, as you know. This Madonna has survived four earthquakes. The first one as early as in 1739. And since then, she has seen devastating earthquakes. And for the people, she brings, she embodies hope, continuity. And after the recent earthquakes in Italy in 2016 and 17, people took her out on a march the whole village around and people from around the areas that had been affected by the earthquake came and paid special respects because they feel that this Madonna is the symbol of life in this area and again people will overcome the recent tragedy just because they have the faith they have this Madonna. Examples like this, and I'm sure many of you, and we've just heard from our previous two speakers, show us that culture is important. It has to be saved in the aftermath of crises, because it is hope for the community. It's not only something to keep in a museum. People have drawn their identity from culture. But the question is, how can we save cultural heritage during a major emergency? And I am talking about region-wide natural disasters or conflicts like the ones we just heard from Dr. Lamia, four wars, protracted crises, which mean multiple people, many, many people are displaced. They lose their homes, lives are lost, Governance is broken. Amidst all such crises, how can we save cultural heritage? Now, I would like to walk you through emergency response. I'm sure many of you are aware how emergency response, general emergency response unfolds. But just uh, let's, let's try to retrace some of the steps. Immediately after a big disaster, a natural disaster, or even a war, the country, in whatever form the government is, declares emergency. And as per the law of that country, one agency becomes the emergency coordinator or the incident commander. Now this Agency in many countries is the Ministry of Home Affairs. But now, in other countries, there are civil protections or one agency. I don't know, maybe in Turkey, there must be one agency that by law becomes the in charge of the incident. And that agency then sets up the emergency system, which is prepared in advance. Next step is an initial rapid assessment of the damage. What is the damage? Which roads have been destroyed? How many people have been affected? Is taken. And at this moment, if the country cannot deal with the emergency, appeal to the United Nations to unfold response is made. Next step is that people 
who are either trapped in a war situation or are in their homes under the rubbles of the homes if it's an earthquake or if they are in a flood situation. There is a search and rescue and people are rescued and brought to temporary shelters. Communication and transportation systems are restored. And then structural safety assessments begin. Like, can people go back to their homes? Are the homes safe enough to go back? Now, in a war situation, you will also have peacekeeping operations going on in parallel. And maybe when UN gives a response in a war situation like in Iraq and in Afghanistan, you have militaries from outside who are operational and are also dealing with some of this aspect. Just when you know the salvage begins when people start looking for what they have lost or when they start thinking about rebuilding, a post-disaster or a post-conflict needs assessment is made. And in this, thanks to the efforts of UNESCO, culture is included. But you see, culture is not included here, it's not here, it's not here, it's not here, but it comes here. The priority setting, setting of priorities is made at this stage, but culture comes at this stage. And then finally, there is a recovery framework put in. But by that time, people on the other side start saving cultural heritage that matters to them irrespective of the system. I deliberately made this zigzag just to show you how outside the periphery <coughs> protection of culture is. Now, what I think Professor Brian Rose said in his uh, talk was that he's been working with military, one of the actors, one emergency actor that works in war situations to incorporate cultural heritage in their response from the beginning. How can we do that from the beginning? Why should emergency actors, civil protection, civil defense, <laughs> military take on the headache of one, adding one more sector when they have to provide transportation, when they have to save lives, when they have to bring water, when they have to, you know, they have many, many competing demands to meet with. And if they do not do this job properly, conflict can arise, peace can be disturbed, people can be angry. So this is really a question, a question that we cultural heritage professionals have to ask ourselves. And uh, well, I have many, based on our experience in past 10 years, in eight natural disaster situations and four wars, we have collected some evidence and I would like to share these reasons with you. The first reason is that whether in a war, in an active conflict situation or in the aftermath of a great disaster, there, there are areas of uh, which are no-go zones, which are access denied zones, which are not safe zones, like Mosul Museum is not in a safe zone. And these safe zones are controlled by emergency actors. <laughs> so if we do not want to coordinate and if we want to go back and work outside the system, then we are, the cultural heritage people are the big losers. And this one is for the emergency actors. This is one month after the uh, earthquake in Nepal. We had the possibility to make a joint mission on behalf of ECOMAS, ICOM, and ICROM and work with the local people there. And this is what we saw. People are sitting at the rubble of a temple. This is a temple which has been fully destroyed. But the flower sellers are sitting there. And they're not sitting there just because they believe 
that they have to do worship. They are sit, sitting there because people are coming and buying flowers to offer as worship as part of the... Oops. So maybe it doesn't like this slide. <laughs> So, you see, it's the gods controlling it. Okay. So, if if the emergency actors will not, uh, I mean, in Nepal, they had to look after immediately. They had to make temples and these other spaces, which are cultural heritage spaces, safe because people depend for their livelihoods on these spaces and they have to be brought back or the business has to be resumed as quickly as possible. The other very good reason for emergency actors to include cultural heritage in their responses is the safety of people. This is, these are young graduates, they are engineering graduates or doctors in Nepal again who were endangering their own lives to go and help people in Nepal who had their ancestral homes and they had these beautiful windows or carvings there still in place which they wanted to take out but had no means, no ways of taking them out. But young people were going around and helping older people to take out things from their homes so that they can save them and when it comes to rebuilding they can put them back in. And if these young people are not given any training before they go in a dangerous structure and I'm sure as a country uh, Turkey is very familiar with earthquakes. You know that once earthquakes hit a house structure how dangerous it is to go in if it has not been shored or if it has not been properly stabilized. But these young people were going there on their own. This is a community initiative. And that's why civilian, civil protection, civil defense, military have to train younger people or volunteers to go and rescue heritage if they want, them to, if they want to help save lives. The other reason, the other very imp uh, compelling reason is that immediately after a big, uh, let's say, disaster, or when the search and rescue begins, and this is in Nepal, machines or sometimes, you know, there is a rush to save people. But nobody is thinking about heritage. And often, <laughs> now it's a virus? No. It looks like a virus. <laughs> So, what happened in this case was that in a rush to get people out of the rubble of temples or city squares, heavy machines were brought in and a lot of the very precious carvings and woods, wood, uh, wooden carvings were displaced and destroyed, also looted at some point because they were left in big heaps. And there was no uh, accounting of this and they were left exposed. And now today, recovery in Nepal has been delayed because wood is a very precious commodity. And all the temples need wood for reconstruction, rebuilding. Whereas the government of Nepal has banned cutting of wood because of the risk of mudslides. And uh, as a result, deforestation has increased in India from across the border. The wood is coming and the donors, many countries who are now involved with the reconstruction of heritage in Nepal are not ready to pay the price for reconstruction. Simply because in this phase, this was not taken into consideration. This is another example, and again it's an earthquake example. After the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, the monuments division of Haiti, ISPAN, 
they decided to stamp the buildings with the, the, the stamp called Batima Historic, it's like historic building do not destroy. On the other hand, the Ministry of Urban Development in Haiti, together with United uh, UNDP, had started another program of tagging the buildings, safety assessment, and tagging the building red, green, yellow. Red means not to be used. They were not aware that the Department of Monuments is doing this exercise. So here is one exercise which is going around and from the government, which is going around and tagging the buildings for destroy, you know, for red, green, yellow, that's like for the safety of the structures. And this is another one in parallel being made for historic buildings. As a result, what happened, many historic buildings were stamped or were tagged as red buildings. That means to be destroyed, to be dis demolished. Because the two departments did not talk to each other. There was no coordination in response. As a result, Haiti lost lo many, many historic structures in its historic city of Jatman. They were destroyed. And again, this happened because the agencies were not talking to each other. Another example is, again, I take you to Nepal. Many uh, heritage places, like archaeological places, as also uh, Dr. Rose pointed out, uh, are often refuge for people after a disaster. People are given temporary shelters. But do they have to be provided like this? This is a tent which has been put with, the, are, these are beautiful sculptures that were used to tie a tent. So when agencies that design, you know, shelters or temporary shelters or allocate spaces for temporary shelters to people, they need to consider the needs for saving heritage and heritage people should be proactively offering, yes, heritage spaces for shelter, but at the same time ensure that this is, that there is some coordination while doing this. The other very important reason is logistics and technical assistance. Again, when you have to go, and this is again from Haiti, where we had to work with the UN peacekeepers because they had the equipment and the engineers who could help us to go and take out, salvage artifacts from the rubble of historic houses. And each and every brick had to be saved for reconstruction purposes. So uh, similarly in Italy, Vigidal Fuoco, which works with the civil protection, which is the Department of Fire, is very highly equipped to provide certain level of technical assistance like putting a temporary cover on the top of a church or hanging from a crane and taking out a painting. So that, that kind of technical assistance or logistics in a large scale disaster are often uh, you know, needed and can be provided but only if you are part of that emergency system. This is another one, uh, the military evacuating the golden throne from Nepal. So again, going into a dangerous building and evacuating. As I said before, if there is a large scale disaster and you have more than 700, 800 sites, like in Mosul now, for example, if reconstruction or if any kind of effort for saving her heritage has to take place in, in northern Iraq, the departments have very little staff. They need volunteers, they need uh, military, and they need other people to help them. But the military needs training. For example, again in Nepal, the Department of Archaeology had no funds for emergency salvage. They could not uh, you know, hire people for clearing sites 
sorting the debris and taking out fragments. So they asked the military and the military did it like this because nobody directed them. And so unintentionally they delayed the recovery process because now again UNESCO has started a special project in Nepal where they are paying about 900 rupees per day to one person to sort out uh, you know the carved wooden like wooden carvings or you know building fragments in order to do reconstruction so this is money lost in the process we do not think about it early on similarly in many areas after the earthquakes or disasters big disasters the government starts doing training for artisans, craftsmen, masons for rebuilding. Cultural heritage also needs to do this. The departments of cultural heritage also need to do this exercise. And again, there can be coordination because after all, it's the same source of money that will go and help restore some of the cultural heritage sites and bring business back or bring tourism revenues back. So there is a very big need for coordination. So I hope with these examples I have convinced you why it is important to include uh, cultural heritage in national emergency management systems and the entry point has to be national. Only then the international community will take it up because whenever there is a request for international assistance the entry point for international assistance is also the national emergency management system. Keeping this in view, we at ICROM, together with Smithsonian Institution, UNESCO, and several other partners and Prince Klaus Fund, have worked over the past 10 years to develop a three-step framework for providing coordinated emergency response. And when I say coordinated emergency response, I mean working with mainstream emergency actors. And it is based on typical actions that are taken to safeguard movable, immovable, immovable and intangible heritage. So basically all types of heritage during conflicts and disasters. And we are the effort, the, our main aim is to standardize response because this is what the emergency actors or the national emergency management systems demand of us. Uh, as uh, Professor Rose said in his talk, it is difficult to standardize sometimes to save which heritage to save. But we have taken, we have looked into those processes and have come up with some interconnected actions for which we are, you know, we have uh, developed some workflows which I'll try to explain in a very short time to you. The first step is situation analysis. As you remember in my first slide I said the humanitarians after the uh, uh, a big disaster strikes or conflict, they do situation analysis. This situation analysis is meant to mimic is meant to imitate the workflow of the humanitarian response and it helps to identify which heritage to save. That's the answer. If you are in a conflict and if you understand that by targeting certain heritage you might be increasing the conflict, you will have to not prior, you come back to it but at that moment, do not prioritize it, prioritize something else. So this is like a value-based analysis that should happen in zero hour after emergency. This step also helps to identify which heritage sites, if you have more than 700, 800 heritage sites, museums, collections to deal with, Situation analysis will help you prepare, together with emergency actors, which sites to go on to next, to do on-site survey, to do community consultations, and to identify damage and risk. 
In this step, we also have developed workflows and methodologies for bringing the data together. Because today, one of the big problems in Iraq, in everywhere else, is this, that people have a lot of data, and there are 11, 12, 13 countries studying the space. There is like uh, satellite data from one country, another country, another country. But what does it mean for people on the ground? How can they use data from 12 countries and try to understand what is my priority now? So that methodology is what we try to address throughout this framework. Then the third step is about security and stabilization actions, which is like typical actions based on these two steps that you will take in that emergency time, whether you will evacuate or not, whether you will show, you know, put sandbags around the structure, whether you will create a temporary storage. So those kind of actions are also then become easier. And if you go through this training, that we have devised step by step, this helps in standardizing response. And of course, oops, sorry. Uh, as uh, Dr. Lamia said, <coughs> documentation is an important aspect. How to document all through and not to lose it. That's, that's the important point. Not to over document, but to document enough so that you have it for the next one. Ongoing risk management. How do I know that today if I have evacuated from Museum 1, the next site will not be looted? And am I ready to unroll response? In Italy, what happened? In 2016, they had one earthquake. They one month after they started doing damage assessment, just then, as they were assessing damage, in the middle of that damage assessment, they had another earthquake. And the church in North Jaffa fell. The damage assessment was not fast enough. And the, it, it did not take into account the risks that could have had, you know, that could have made other buildings fall, the aftershocks. So, ongoing risk management is a very important aspect and an undermined aspect in emergency response. And this is something that we are, with our partners, trying to develop, uh, you know, skills and uh, knowledge sets for, so that we can easily transfer it to emergency actors as well as cultural heritage professionals. So this is the training. It's called First Aid to Cultural Heritage in Times of Crisis. It's a five-week international course. And we have, we, our major partners are uh, Smithsonian Institution, the Prince Klaus Fund, and so far, uh, UNESCO Netherlands, a National Commission of UNESCO in Netherlands, but also UNESCO Paris is one of the collaborators. We have uh, so far done five international courses and uh, I, the number is like 99, just 99. Hopefully it will go more than that. And in 69 countries. And because Prince Klaus Fund is involved, uh, they have invested in the follow-up of this training. So as a result, after each international course, the participants of the training have the possibility to apply for funds to replicate the training in their own country. And as a result, we've had 40 workshops. So five international courses have led to 40 workshops. And one of our star uh, participants is Abdul Hamid Saleh, a cultural first aider. And by the way, also Leila Saleh, uh, the person who figured in Dr. Gamia's presentation, the one who went to Mosul Museum, is also a trainee of this course. So, Abdul Hamid is from Egypt. He has made his Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation. He has trained, after the training, over 90 cultural heritage first aiders. And his team was brought in to respond after the bombing in Islamic Museum 
in Cairo. So his theme was recognized by the government of Egypt as uh, a crisis response team. And now he's training many, many more people in and beyond Egypt. He has also been working in Iraq. Two of our other trainees have started a, uh, like a, a, a network called Balkan Care for all Balkan countries. One of them is from Albania and the other one is from Serbia. So just because they are from Albania and Serbia, the two countries that have had an uneasy past, let's say, and now they are you know, joining hands to develop a first aiders team for all of Balkan countries is a very big step forward for us. Recently, as I said before, the aim of this training is to incorporate the uh, cultural heritage aspect in national emergency management systems. We did an international workshop with the Italian Civil Protection, <coughs> which has cultural heritage in its responses. And this was held for five countries, mainly Jordan, Cyprus, uh, Palestine, uh, Israel, and uh, uh, and also there were some other member states from uh, Europe, uh, like uh, France, Spain, and Italy. And people were mainly from civil defense and civil protection. And our purpose was to understand how and at which stage they can incorporate cultural heritage in their emergency response, what it will take for them to have coordination ability just to coordinate during an emergency and what it will take for them to have implementational capacity. That means these, depart these countries are thinking of developing departments within their civil defense or civil protection units specially to save cultural heritage. And this I think will be the way forward. We have also brought out some publications. This one is on endangered heritage, uh, it's on emergency evacuation of heritage collections, specially targeted to areas in conflict. It will be soon available in Turkish, thanks to the, uh, I think, uh, your uh, National Commission for UNESCO and ICORP Turkey. Uh, this, will, this is available online for download, free download from UNESCO and from ICROM. We will have a Spanish, uh, a, a French, an Arabic, as well as uh, a Georgian version and a Nepali version is coming up soon. Our future orientations include to expand the partnership. So while I stand here, this is a call for partnership. Anybody can join us in this movement. We would like to continue developing online tools and resources so that people wherever they are, communities wherever they are, can become participants in their own cultural recovery. And this book will be coming out soon on the first aid methodology that I outlined. We will definitely will be doing more training at international and regional levels. And UNESCO has included first aid training in its action for the Middle East and North Africa region. Our aim is to create three regional hubs, regional areas where, you, where cultural heritage first aiders can be deployed readily and where they can also train others and this would be in three risk prone regions and the idea would be that the regional hubs will act in a regional fashion that they will be able to work with international emergency management systems as well as national emergency management systems. And now uh, at the end uh, I would like to show you a video. Uh, it's not there? Oh yeah, yeah, I know how to do it. I just have to hit escape.
technology challenge. We need to read for it. Can you just hit refresh? Well, it's just a, a small video the coverage of, from BBC uh, about, the, about the training. I just wanted to show you how the training looks like because it's very interactive, it's very like uh, hands-on and in simulation mode. Uh, we put through people, uh, we put people through a lot of, a series of simulation when they come for this training, so it's very hands-on. And as we see, technology will always remain a challenge. But hopefully, with together we can overcome it. And with that, I think uh, we should close. In any case, this is not working. Thank you very much for your attention. And. Uh